Okay, so welcome back. Uh, this is the last lecture for the cloud computing module. Uh, I will do a sort of revision today, go back to the material that we covered in the lab. Uh, I will explain uh, again in detail how the logbook marking process uh, will actually work, which will be in two weeks from now, and I'll give you a little bit of help for the exam uh, as well. I have added some new material. If you go into the uh, assessments and support materials section in the module and you will see them there so first of all i have the drop boxes for the logbook so there is the first drop box which is for normal submissions until the deadline uh, which if i remember correctly is on the 12th of may 11 o'clock at night okay uh, and then there's a late submission drop box for anybody that has an ecf or they just don't manage to uh, submit on time that will start from 11 o'clock on that uh, 12th of May until the 26th of May, which is two weeks after that. Okay, so if you do have an ECF form and you are, you are uh, eligible for a late submission, you get two more weeks in order to work on the material. All right. Uh, be careful. Don't leave the submission for the last few minutes of the deadline. Yes, the submission inbox itself will close at 11 o'clock. All right, so if you're hoping to submit at 11.01, you won't be able to. Okay. Pertinent to that, the process of marking your logbooks is as explained on this week. So, on Wednesday morning and Friday all day, we will have the assessment of the logbooks. You need to come in, in your normal uh, lab session, as it's allocated on your timetable, all right, uh, you need to be sitting on the computer where you always work and you need to open up your logbook. I will mark your logbook on that day, on that time slot. Okay, the only time that I will read your logbook will be then. This means that your logbook must be finished by the time you come to the lab to get assessed. All right. If you come to the lab and tell me, ah, look, Vas, I haven't managed to finish that last lab sheet, you won't get marked on the last lab sheet. Okay, really, practically, the deadline for your logbook is when you come into the lab to get assessed. All right, I, I am happy with you to make minor changes. And in fact, I might tell you, look, this screenshot is wrong. Maybe get the correct version of it make some changes like that and submit them by, you know, Friday, 11 o'clock or whenever it is. Okay. But if you're missing entire sections, if you're meeting, missing entire lab sheets and so on, then I will not, you know, there will be no point because really I will mark you in the lab and I will tell you your mark in the lab as well. Okay. So you'll know how much you got right there and then. Now, the other detail to this is you are three completely full lab sessions, which means I have to go through 48 logbooks in three hours. Super fun for me. It means that I cannot spend too much time on your computers. You need to have your computers running. You need to be logged in. Your Prometheus virtual machine needs to be running. Any configuration files that you have created need to be on the screen open in gedit or any other editor that you might like and any virtual machines in your cloud need to be running and ideally showing that they're actually working like pinging or if you're using a service being logged in as some user and so on to actually show that they are actually working okay so when i come and sit on your computer your logbooks must be open either inside prometheus or outside prometheus whatever you like and your system must be fully operational and running. This means that I need you to come into the lab for once in the teaching block ahead of time. All right, so when I do start marking at nine o'clock, I will start from the computer that is closest to the, to the glass uh, display of the server. So I will start on 65, really, and work my way through there. So especially if you're on the left side of the class, make sure you definitely come in before nine o'clock if possible, all right? Or before the start of your lab session, okay? Now, I will sit with you, I will read your logbook, I will scan through it. If I see something that I don't like or doesn't make sense, 
I will look at your computer and check your work. And if I really don't like what I see, I will, for lack of a better word, interrogate you. Yes? You need to be able to explain to me absolutely everything that's in your logbook. I do understand that we, you all help each other in the lab and we, with our lab assistants, help you in the lab. Okay, it's fine if you haven't done something completely by yourself. However, if somebody else has helped you do something, make sure you understand what it is. All right, it's part of the learning process. I'm happy with it. If someone has done a specific part of a lab sheet for you and they've explained to you and said, look, for this to work, you need to have this and this done in that way, and you understand what was done and why it was done, that's fine. You've learned it. Okay, I'm happy with it. So if you can explain it to me, then I'm happy with it. All right. If I do see something on your logbook and you cannot explain to me what it is, and I ask you questions about it and you don't know what it is, and come back to me with a, my favorite reply from last semester was, it was in the lab sheet. Funnily enough, which was a command that wasn't in the lab sheet, but never mind. I will give you zero because it's plagiarism. Yes? So, it's better to have a logbook that doesn't have a lot of material in it, lots of lab sheets, lots of work written in it, but you understand everything, rather than risking an assessment of ads. Okay, so make sure everything that's in your logbook, you understand it and you can explain it to me. All right. Now, uh, I will go through your logbook, I will read everything and so on. Uh, the rules for the assessment are laid out in this paragraph. So, for example, if you are in the lab but your logbook is not finished, you can still finish your logbook by the deadline and submit it on time. However, you will get marked as late and capped at 40%. Okay, so if I do come into the lab and you tell me, ah, oh, yes, Vas, I've done all the work on the computer, here it is, I haven't finished my logbook, I will offer you the option. I can give you the mark that you can get on your logbook as it is, or if it's a really poor logbook and you're not happy with it and you think that an extra day or two would help you with it, depending on whether on a Wednesday or Friday, then I can tell you, look, you can submit it on time and I will mark this as late and cap it at 40%. Okay, so I will give you that option. So it's very important that your logbook is as finished as it can be on the day of the assessment, yeah, or the day in the lab. If you are in the lab but you submit your logbook after the deadline, you, you will get marked as late and capped at 40%. So if you submit after Friday the 12th, after 11 o'clock, naturally it will be a late submission. My advice to you, make sure you come in the lab and the logbook is finished. I look at it, you submit it right there and then. Okay, don't say, oh yes, I'm finished with this. Let me de-stress and go home and I will submit it. I've had people that have forgotten to submit the logbooks. Okay, and missed out on, on a very good mark because of this. All right, so once I've seen it, as long as I don't tell you that you need to make some minor corrections or anything, go on to Moodle and submit it as it is from there. It's the safest thing to do. Okay, if you are in the lab and you don't submit them, Yes, so if you can do come to the lab session but don't submit the logbook at all, then that is a non-submission and that is a zero. Okay, so if you forget to submit the logbook as I said before, it's a zero. If you do not come to the lab, I will take attendance, even if you uh, have uh, submit your logbook and completed everything, if you're not in the lab, you will be getting a non-submission. Not coming into the lab and just submitting a logbook on Turnitin is the cheater's favorite way of trying to walk around this. Yes? If uh, I, I'm not joking, especially last semester I had people that paid other people to do the logbook for them. It was brilliant because you could see that the commands used in there were relevant. Never mind, it's fine. So, if you do not come into the lab, automatically it's a non-submission. All right, whether you submit the logbook afterwards or not. So when I do uh, go through my, so, so the way I mark them is, I go through my list in the lab, that little map that I have with where you're all sitting and everything. I check the number, I go to see if there is a submission, if it is a late submission or not, and then I allocate the marks that are written there on that, on that uh, piece of paper 
onto the spreadsheet and give them to the office. Okay, I do plan to submit your marks as quickly as possible. All right, uh, because I want to be finished with everything in May so that they can go to Greece in June. So yes, you should get your marks from this fairly quickly, possibly within the next, I think I'll probably just sit down on the weekend and do it. Okay, so by that next Monday, you should have your marks for this. And the same goes for your exam as well. Unfortunately, your exam is on Thursday, the 1st of June, 1st of June. Uh, but you will get your marks on Thursday, the 1st of June. Okay. No, they will. The results will not be given to you at the end of the exam. Okay. I will have a look because what I usually do is because by that time I will definitely have all of the marks, even from the late submissions as well. I compare the marks and I do the average. So if you scored 42% in the exam and 35% in the logbook, that works to just shy of 40%. I will change the mark to make you pa pass. Yes, or if you score something like a 58 or 59 percent, I will usually give you one mark, either in the logbook mark or in the exam, whatever comes later. It's in this case, it's going to be the exam, so that it push you up to the bind boundary to the next bracket. Yeah, so that you don't get, you know, you won't get. This, it's very unlikely that you'll get a 58 in a unit of mine. I will turn it into a 60. Okay, so the logbook will work like this. Uh, the other item that you need to care about is the exam. So I have this lovely little video here that explains how the exams uh, will actually run and some uh, tips and tricks on how to actually go about the exam itself. It's very important that you come to the exam center early. Yes, and I'm talking 15 or 20 minutes before the start of the exam. We, there are a lot of you. First of all, your exam is spread across three different locations. So don't ask your friends where the exam is. Go and look at your timetable. Yeah. Some of you will be in A029 here in Anglesey building. Some of you will be in Lion Gate, uh, LG 014 A and B. And some of you are at the Learning Center, which is way over there on Western Churchill Avenue in 221. All right. So make sure you check your timetable to know exactly where you are. If you go to the wrong room, your password to log into the exam might not work. So you might not be able to take the exam, not to mention the fact that there might not be enough space to actually sit you down. Okay, so make sure you go to the correct location for your exam. Make sure you go there early so that when we start letting people into the rooms, we usually start as about 15 minutes before the exam starts, you need to settle down, you need to log into your computer, you need to launch the safe exam browser. So you need to follow an entire process of actually finding and logging into the exam. It's better to do this in a not stressed condition. Yes, be there early, go in on time, sit on your computer, tidy up your jacket or whatever, any pen or paper that you might need and so on. And relax and wait for two or five or even 10 minutes until we tell you that you can start the exam. All right. When you do go into the exam, the exam is an open book. So you are allowed a double-sided piece of paper of A4 size. Don't, don't bring the poster. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you're allowed a double-sided uh, A4. It can either be typed or handwritten. If you can make the world's tiniest letters, you can copy your entire logbook onto it and bring a magnifying glass and read it on it. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't care. There will be commands that are needed in the exam, so you can have the commands uh, typed into the paper so that you can bring them with you so that you don't have to remember them, memorize them. You can uh, put in there the location of uh, important files in the operating system, what things actually do, what services actually do, and so on, whatever you like. Okay, so you can have a piece of paper with you, use it. Okay, now I do have a mock exam here as well. And the sole purpose of this is not to give you some of the questions of the exam, obviously. Uh, it's for you to see what it actually looks like and how it will actually work. All right, uh, so you will have the exam questions coming up like this. You will have your time available for the exam on a live clock running on this side. You will have the question here. 
and you will have the quiz navigation panel on the right. This is very useful and very important because what I want you to do as soon as you log in and start your exam, I want you to work through all of the questions one by one. So you go with question one. Do you immediately know the answer? If you immediately know the answer and you're confident in it, answer it, go to the next one. Next question, do you know it? No. If you don't know it, skip it. Click on to the third question. Do you know it immediately? Yes. Answer it, go to the next one. So if you follow this process, it will be 50 questions for one hour to do this. Okay. If you follow this process within about 10 minutes, you will find yourself having gone through all of the questions and then you will have answered all of the ones that you immediately know. So you know now, for example, you've answered 20 questions already, so now you have 50 minutes to answer 30 questions. All right. So it's the most, it's the psychologically, it's the best way to deal with the exam. If you do them one by one and you just get stuck in the first five questions, then you'll think, oh my God, it took me 20 minutes to do the first five questions. I'm, I'm dead. You know, that's it. So it's not a good idea. You have the navigation panel on the right. Look at all of the questions. If you know how to answer them, immediately answer them. Move on to the next. If you don't know them, move on to the next. Okay, so you will reach the end of the questions and you have a good idea of whether you can relax and think about the rest of the questions or go back and rethink your life choices because you don't know any of the answers. <laughs> okay, so either way, it's best to do it this way. All right, there will be different types of questions. So, for example, if the answer button is round, it's a multiple choice. It means that there's only one correct answer for it. Okay, uh, what different kinds of questions do we have? Let's see. You can have matching questions, yes? So, for example, I'll give you a, a phrase or something and then there will be something that you need to match next to it to which one is the correct, okay? Uh, you can go on to the next type of questions. Again, this is a multiple choice. All right, that's not really helping me, but never mind. If it's a square, it's a multiple response. It means that either one or more or all of the answers I do do that sometimes, need to be selected for you to get the full marks for the question. Okay, usually questions like that will ask you what are the components needed for X, Y, Z to work? All right. Again, multiple response. The hardest question you can get is this, fill in the blanks. Yes, I will usually ask you to type in a command or I might ask you something like in this question. Yes. Obviously, it's a very easy answer. Yes. What is the fully qualified domain name for this particular computer? Senna Net Labi Portis UK. Be careful with typos. There should generally be no capital letters in your answers here. All right. Everything should be in small letters and they should be correct. Especially if it's a command, if you type a command in a terminal and you make a typo, the command is wrong. It's black and white, there's no gray in between. Yes? So be careful of typos in questions like this. And you will have a piece of paper with you, so really there's no excuse. All right. Tap, tap, tap. Uh, I might have something like this, that something is missing in the middle, you know, you know, just tap it. If it has like five spaces, it doesn't necessarily mean that the word that we're looking for is five spaces. Yes, five letters. We're not playing hangman here. Yeah. And uh, this is a unique and favorite type of question. I call it the kindergarten question because you can drag stuff and put them here and, you know, make a pretty picture. As long as it's correct, yeah? All right. So these are the sort of questions that you will get. If you run out of time, the test will submit itself. So if you run out of time and you've only answered 45 out of the 50 questions, you will have answered 45 out of It's not that, you know, you submit a zero. So don't panic. And certainly don't start screaming in the exam center. 
it has also happened in the past. <laughs> okay, if you need anything during the exam, just raise your hand and we'll come and help you. Okay, uh, I have double and triple checked my questions. They shouldn't have typos or they shouldn't be vague in any way. They should be very clear cut. All right, if you do think that something is weird with them, I will be in one of the exam centers. Most probably I'll be in Lionsgate because it's the biggest one. All right, uh, I can come and help you with it. And all the other invigilators that will be in the other rooms will also be able to help you with it. And if it is a question that is actually about the material itself, they can actually call me and ask me. It's like really far-fetched scenario, yes? And that's, that's it with the exam. I don't think there's anything else I need about this. So this mock exam is available here, so you can go and have a try at it yourself, although it's a bit pointless, you know. Uh, let me go back to courses. So on, remember, all of this is inside assessments and support materials. Okay, uh, so the video is here, watch it as well. The mock exam is here. There are some exa sample questions as well, some more from, uh, from previous times. So you can have a look at them as well if you like. Now, as for what will be in the exam itself and what needs to be uh, explained well in the logbook, I will go through everything here. So uh, it's important that you have a look at this document. So the first thing that I want you to read is this one. Okay, cloud design with Open Nebula. I want you to know the theory behind how a cloud works. I want you to know all of the components that make up a cloud and exactly what they do. Because for example, ta-da, here is the schematic from that question. Yeah, so I need you to know what all of the individual blocks required by a cloud to run actually do and why we need them. So if you go further down, then everything is explained. I mentioned in the cloud what the KVM nodes do, how the storage works, so the data stores and everything else, and so on. The different types of data stores that you get in Open Nebula, what do they actually do? You know, the system data store stores the running uh, images of the running virtual machines, whereas the image data store stores the images that are there ready to be instantiated to be used and so on. As for the installation itself, I need you to know, uh, well, you don't need to worry about too much about the Prometheus preparation part. Okay, this is all just logistics to make the thing work in the lab. So I don't really care about this very much. Yeah. Front-end installation, I want you to know what repositories are and how they work. All right, and how we can make changes and how we can tell our operating system to read from new sources online in order to be able to download and install some material. So you create a repository, that repository contains a, an, an address inside it where those files are actually held. And then you update the repos and you tell the system to you know read this file and update your repository table so you can actually download whatever you like so that then you can do yum install something in order to get some files online. Uh, I want you to know why we prefer yum, apt, get, dnf, and all those types of internet-based methods of installation of software. All right. And I want you to know the different types of installations of software that we have. So we can do yum install something. What else can we do in order to install some software in Linux? What's like the oldest and most complicated and annoying way? No. RPM. RPM is another method, but it's not as annoying as what I mean. Think of the Open V Switch installation. Configure, make, make, install, and so on. Compiling something from source. Yeah? So there are different types of installations. I want you to know them. And then I want you to know the differences between all of them. All right. I want you to know where the, the root password is stored and why it's a bad idea to change the contents of this file after the service has run, and how do you actually change the password once the service has been running, and so on, what command you need to use. I want you to know the components of what uh, what, what Open Nebula consists of. All right, so I want to know that there is an Open Nebula daemon, there is a Sandstone Open Nebula, what do they actually do? 
I won't ask too much about CLI, about the command line interface, because we haven't really used it, so it wouldn't really be fair. Uh, I want you to remember the port where... The, no, I don't. Don't worry. It's 9869. It's fine. Uh, locations of the files. I would like you to know where you know that you know where the user's home directory is in a cloud installation in Open Nebula. Uh, I want you to know what the Open Nebula node KVM does. So why do we need a KVM node inside an Open Nebula cloud? All right, the answer is because we need a computer that can start up virtual machines. We need a virtualization host. I want you to know what this does. So why do we change our SSH config? So we basically do this in order to provide passwordless SSH access between all of the individual daemons and services that run Open Nebula, so that they wouldn't have to ask for a password every time a process tries to connect. And that's it for the first lab sheet. Moving on to the virtual machine creation. Most importantly, I want you to know what a virtual machine depends on in order to be running inside our cloud. So to have an instance of a virtual machine running, that instance needs to depend on a template. To create that template, you need all of the various components available to, a, to, to that template. So you need CPU cores, you need RAM, you need disk images to act as hard drives, you need some network cards to act as network cards, and so on. And of course, you need all of the other minor details, like is it going to be a KVM virtualized uh, template? Uh, is it going to be something that's going to be accessed via VNC remotely? And so on. All right. I don't care too much about the networking uh, infrastructure that we're creating here, because this is very specific to the setup that we have here. I will care about the network later on in OVS and what it does. I want you to know, of course, what a virtualization host actually does in Sandstorm and why do we use it and why it's important for it to be running correctly. I want you to know, as I said, the different types of data stores that we have. We have three different types of data stores in Open Nebula. So I want you to know what they are and what they do. You can find all of this in great detail in that first PDF file. Uh, how the networks actually work and the different types of networks that we have. We've used OVS, but there are other network capabilities in Open Nebula as well. So if you log into Open Nebula and go into the networking section, it's like you know, when you create a new network card, there's a drop down menu. It says you know, firewall, OVS, VLAN, whatever it is. So the different types of images that you can have, uh, blank hard drive space, operating system image, uh, CD-ROM, what are they, why are they different, what are the differences between them. Persistent and non-persistent images, persistent and non-persistent instantiated templates. What is the difference between all of them? And what are like the four possible scenarios that we can have with virtual machines that are starting in the cloud? with respect to the persistency of their images and of their templates as they are started. All of the characteristics of makeup template and everything, and that's it. On the next lab sheet, I mostly care about the various states that the virtual machine can be in inside the cloud. Not much else. I mean, for the rest of the lab, you create users, you attach the touch hard drive, you're basically exploring the interface in order to see what's what. Out of all of this lab, sheet, I really care about this. What are the different states and what's the difference if the virtual machine is powered off and kept onto the cloud or powered off and moved onto the uh, image data store and so on. And then we go to OVS. the theory behind it, what it is, why do we need it, what can it do for us, so it will give us, it gives us great flexibility with regards to the networking configuration that we want to have between our cloud and the outside world and our cloud and all of the virtual machines, all of the networking infrastructure that we want to create inside the cloud itself. Uh, I want you to know the installation process in general. Don't worry about writing all of the commands in that piece of paper one by one, it's a bit pointless. I'm not going to ask you yum install GCC make and all of the other dependencies that are needed. Yes, obviously. But I want you to know that we're installing it from source. We're creating an RPM that is specifically tailored 
to our operating system on our computer so we can then install it with minimum dependencies required after that all right so this is basically what we're doing here the process of what we're doing here study the process where the files are being created where they are being stored and so on because we do copy files across and we do create new directory structure inside our home folder at some point with sources and all that where the rpm actually gets generated into all right and that should be it i definitely want you to know the obvious vsctl command that we've used so obvious vsctl show will show us all of the obvious components that are configured and are running in our system and if nothing is running it will simply show us the version of obvious that we're using the obvious vsctl add br will add a bridge del br will remove a bridge there's an add port command there's a del port command and so on obvious bridges need to need to consist of ports and those ports are the endpoints to the bridge that we're creating and they can be pretty much wherever we like them to be want them to be i want you to know that you need to have the required infrastructure behind obvs with regards to the configuration of the operating system behind it so if you do create a network card and call it net 30 in obvs there needs to be a net 30 ifcfg file in etc config network scripts to support it as a device in the system don't worry about all the details and what everything absolutely does in here all right inside the configuration files of the ifcfg uh routing i do want you to know how it works so i might give you an example of a noisepfd.com file and tell you you know which network cards will work on routing in this file all right with regards to networking itself I do want you to understand the basic principles of IP addressing and CIDR. Yes, I've spent a long time explaining. <laughs> I want you to know what a subnet mask is, what a 24-bit long subnet mask is, and why is it bigger than a 29-bit long subnet mask, what it actually means with regards to the hosts, the number of hosts that you can have in a network of whatever size and so on and so forth. Okay, I want you to know what the idea is behind the default gateway in the system, and everything else that has to do with that all right so you need to have i'm going to say basic understanding of ip addresses and cidr if you don't go back to one of my lectures there was a link to firewall.cx you can go in there and have a look or you can just re-watch that lecture all right i think it was the obvious lecture actually anyway the questions on routing will be relatively limited but you might get for example a question of you know convert this ip address from binary to decimal or convert this subnet mask from binary to decimal or whatever so it be scrap you can put a table of cidr <laughs> subnet masks in your paper no, if you yeah, like so oh yes yes of course like yes of course so yes you're allowed to bring a calculator and you will have a blank piece of paper so bring pens with you yeah all right so if you do need to do calculations like this, yes, good, thanks for reminding me that, you can actually do calculations on there. All right. There will be nothing from the last lab sheet in the exam because there is nothing new in the last lab sheet. The last lab sheet is sort of like a coursework where you apply everything that you learned from all the previous lab sheets in order to create your cloud. All right. So there's no need to actually read anything from it. All right, it's just instructions on how to build, you know, the requirement of what I want you to actually build on your system. Okay. Any questions about the logbook or the exam at all? Yeah? Before you come to the lab for the logbooks, make sure that you read that section so that you read all of the instructions and you know exactly what needs to happen because I will really struggle to work my way through all 48 of you in three hours okay so if you help me out i'll be in a better mood and therefore give you better marks <laughs> all right any question okay thank you very much